Hello, everyone. Thank you for checking out this episode. Today, I'm here with R.A. Salvatore, well-known at least in the D&D community or role-playing community as the writer of the Dreads books. And um, we're here today to talk about a little about the uh, Generation Trilogy. Um, and we'll do our best to not spoil too much. Um, so first, thank you for, for, for taking the time to talk to us, um, Mr. Salvatore. Sure. And yeah, my pleasure. And uh, first, um, yeah, so, so for those that are that have been that have read your books but may have stopped or maybe um they're now catching up to the generations trilogy uh what would you say is going on here i mean we have zach Nefing back to life we have we have demons we have <laughs> uh we have all sorts of things how, how would how would you describe this uh the completion of the circle that was begun back in 1987 when i started writing the crystal shard but this is really the, the place where the legend of Dritz comes full circle. Doesn't mean it's over, but comes full circle. And we get to see how history rhymes back in the days before Dritz was born. The Generations trilogy takes place in two parts. Uh, each book takes place. There's four parts in each book, but two of them are back before Dritz was born, back in Menzo Berenzan when Zach McLean and Jarl Axel were good friends. And then the other two are going forward from Hero, which is the last book that I wrote with Wizards of the Coast under their publishing uh, program, which ended. And if Dritz had ended with Hero, I would have been okay with that because I, I thought it was a fitting ending. He had his, he had his, um, his showdown with Loth where he finally kind of said, nope, that's it. I'm not, you don't get it. There's no way I could ever worship someone like you. Um, and he stood his ground. So I thought that was a that would have been an okay ending. But since the program I was able to keep going with the with Harper Voyager via a license with Wizards of the Coast, I decided now I can really bring that whole story from homeland to now relentless full full circle. And so I did. I, I read somewhere where you talked about how after the uh, homecoming books that you were hoping to do the generations book because you had a you have more to say do you felt that you be able to complete that in these books um what I had in mind then yeah that's that's what I there was one you know I I think there's still a, one at least more thing to say but the main thing with Dritz was the and now I had Zach came back at the end of at the end of Hero, and that was something else I wanted to explore. So, yeah, I, I think I'm pretty much there now where I wanted to be. Hmm. So, Zach Nefine and Chris, I, I I am very happy that you have this element in these in these uh, these books. Uh, it's it really stands out to me. I mean, uh, I mean. You've, you write fantastic adventures and uh, your cast of characters are amazing, but it's always Dritz's um, uh, perspective of things uh, that I find the most intriguing of your work. And the fact you brought Zagnafane in and and it's like a kind of a new twist in a way of, of um, uh, looking at, at kind of like looking into like culture and uh, race and, and history. Uh, is, yeah. Was that, would you feel, was that the purpose of bringing Saturn Fane back in to these books? Yeah, I, well, look, every time I put the spotlight on Menzo Barons on, since the beginning, every time I've gone back there, it's become more and more apparent that Dritz wasn't unique, that, that it's, it's loath, it's not, it's not the drow, it's loath, it's the, it's the smothering of the Lothian uh, demonic influence that has held that city down. And so what I really got the spotlight in this trilogy that I thought was critical and something I've wanted to do for a long, long time, I've been threatening to write a Zach and Fane Jarl Axel book for 20 years now, is showcase that it, Dritz isn't the only one. He was the only one that had the guts to leave and lived that we know of in my books, but he wasn't the only one. In fact, what you see through the Generations trilogy is that most of Menzo Berenzan hates Menzo Berenzan. There's just nothing they can do about it. And so I thought that was important to get out there, especially with all the um, 
you know, the spotlight on the drought because of drifts and because of the game. So, yeah, I, I, I really wanted to go back and tell that story. And I did. And it felt really good. And I thought the timing of Relentless couldn't have been better. That wasn't people say, oh, but how'd you get this done so fast? Now, this book's been planned for, for years, four years. It just the timing couldn't be better than to coincide with what's going on in the world right now around us. So to me, that felt really satisfying. But the, the ability to go back there and, and, you know, the funny thing about all the books from the very beginning is this notion of the drow are evil, the drow are evil. And the people who are telling you the drow are evil are part of cultures that are just as evil as the drow culture, often. The Luskin people saying, well, the drow are evil. Well, what are the pirates? What are the magistrates at, at um, Prisoner's Carnival? You know, it's the, the whole, one of the whole things about the Dark Elf books from the beginning is this perception of evil. Is it really, you're excusing your allies and vilifying your enemies or people you perceive as the other and the enemies for the same things. And that's bothered me all my life. So, you know, the, the, the drow are evil, but have the drow ever done anything worse than Prisoner's Carnival and Lust? And so in the books, the only, that, I've kept that very much as an unreliable narrator type of thing, because one of the points of these books is that you can't determine good and evil based on whether or not the person doing it is a friend of yours or an ally of yours. So now I get to show the drow with the drow, concerned only with the drow, and you see that they're really not any different from the elves of the Moonwood, or the, except that they're under the influence of this demonic cult that is pushing them ever downward. I, so I've that always, was really important for me to do that. I, what, I, what I loved about your books, and I still love this about your books, is that you've always tried to break, I don't know if this was intentional, but you just keep breaking these, like, I don't, I don't know if barriers is the right word, but the, I remember when, when we started reading your books and then suddenly this, this drow was breaking, uh, breaking stereotypes and, and, and you're, you're kind of exploring like, like the philosophy of what's good and evil and, when, and perception and race. Um, and that I, I remember that it, it, it kind of blew my mind that all of us wanted to play drought. And I, and I love the fact that it, in a way you're kind of the, uh, one of the, uh, how should I say it? The, um, you pretty much sparked the idea of like, okay, we don't want to play these, these uh, what these what Dini has set for us. I want I want to play a draw. I want to play an orc. I want to play uh, what 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 the books might have said that these are like monster races. You know, these um, did that occur to you writing these books that that you would that this would happen? You know, when I the drow were in when I started writing these books, the drow were described strictly as monsters. What I what I used drow for in my D and D campaigns was the humble parties because. Remember, you could give low-level drow characters this great gear and they would be able to beat a mid-level party and really humble them. So the drow were like, oh God, it's drow run because they were so powerful. But in terms of the culture, the idea of something that's just a race of evil beings is about as boring as you can get. It makes no sense. They'd all kill each other. It, there's nothing there. There's nothing to explore. There's no, there's no nuance. There's no, how do you build a society? And so when I, start, when I first created Menzo Baron Zion, I've said this a hundred times, I based it on the five families of New York from Mario Puzo's The Godfather, an Italian kid from the Northeast. I grew up in a neighborhood that, we, I mean, it wasn't a big mob neighborhood or anything like that, but we knew people who were connected, if you know what I mean, that type of thing. And so it was based to me on something, what I really wanted to do with Menzo Bar Baron was take something that was, that was isolated and foreign to people who didn't understand. It really wasn't, that, but the, it would be, the truths of the place would be masked by the fear of the place, which is true of, of the mob or organized crime at any time in history, or not just organized crime, but you know, organized groups that may be perceived as evil, but that's from the outsiders who don't understand the role they're playing among them, their own societies. And for me, the idea of the drow are intrinsically, hereditarily, you know, naturally evil made no sense. It makes them boring. 
you know, I, and one of the things that really I, I can, I can make a, I can make an analogy now. There's a show that came out on History Channel a few years ago called Vikings. It's an amazing show. These people are brutal. They're vicious. They think nothing of killing a kid or, or a woman or, or a non-combatant, an old man. They think nothing of it. But we're rooting for them as the show goes on because they're humanized and we understand their culture. And if you see more of that, what you understand is your culture kind of does the same thing. You just kind of look past that because you understand the familiarity of your culture that makes you welcome. So for me, it was really important. This has been important in my life, my whole life, to get to strip down all the, the labels and the, and the prejudices and all the baloney we put upon other people, strip it down to the basics and, and get to the truth of the matter that we're all the same, that we all, we all want the same things. We have different ideas of how to get there. This is just who I've always been. I was this way in college. I got yelled at in college. Uh, when I was writing a column called Salvos for my, for my college newspaper, because I, I refused to take a narrow view on, on worldly things. And so to me, the drow being just monsters is, it, there's plenty of monsters. You have demons, you have undead, you have, you know, you could even say there are, there are demonic races that are, their only purpose for being is to serve their demons. But that didn't fit with the drow for me. They were too clever. They were too intelligent. They had too much reasoning power. So, you know, yeah, it was important to me that, and that, that's been the message of all the books. I just, it became a little more overt because I was back in Benzo Baron's on, and I thought it was important to put it out there. Going back to the, um, the Generations trilogy. So um, my friends and I were reading these books and um, we were enjoying what you're doing here. And for some of them, it's difficult because especially if you come from a broken home and the fact that, especially if you're meeting a father again for the first time in ages, what you perceive of what you thought he was is not the same when you see or meet your exactly. father years later. The Zactophane, right? The Zactophane effect? Yeah. How he comes back and he's very limited in, in some ways at first. Mm. Where, yeah. where, where did... I mean, you're writing these, this relationship and this dynamic very well. Uh, did, did this something that you, you experienced or you saw or you, you read or like where, where, where did it all come from? If I may ask. I think I'm not old enough to remember because I'm old enough to remember. And what I mean by that is my father was probably one of the most progressive people you will ever meet. Very tolerant. He's very loving. He's very caring man. And I'm talking, you know, I'm, I'm old. And <laughs> this was in the late 60s and early 70s. But in our neighborhood, he was by, our neighborhood was very kind of patriarchal and, and kind of uh, old school, if you will. My father wasn't. Uh, you know, I remember my father on, on my 10th birth, my, well, I was nine years old, actually, watching the 68 Olympics. And I'll never forget this. We were watching the 1968 Olympics and Tommy Smith and Juan Carlos just finished first and third in the relay, or I mean, in the 200 meter, I think it was one of the, the shorter races in track and field. And when they went up on the, when they went up on the platforms, they raised their fists, black fists, while the, the anthem played, black glove fists. It was a protest while the anthem played. And I remember I was, I was on the couch and I looked over at my dad and he had tears in his eyes. And I thought he was going to explode because my father was American. He was a first generation Italian American who wouldn't let us say Salvatore. It had to be Salvatore because we're American. Fought in World War II, was wounded in Cherbourg, fought the Nazis, Mr. True Patriot. And I thought he was going to explode. And I, I said, you know, I asked him, you know, what, what do you think of that? And he looked at me and he goes, Bobby, I didn't go to France to fight for a piece of cloth. I went to France to fight for what it stood for. And that is what it stands for. And it blew my mind. Okay, but that was my dad. And so he, for his time, he was an incredibly progressive person. If he had, he died in 1984. If we could take him and bring him back now and drop him into this world, that's very different than 1984 and certainly different than 1968. 
he would be confused. He would be like Archie Bunker from All in the Family. That's just the truth. Now, I know where his heart is, just like I knew where Zach McLean's heart is. And so I knew it would just take him being able to get past the, the change, the unusualness, the, the surprise of where he was to come to truth in his heart. But this is the reality. And I think it's reflected. I think it's reflected in, in whenever you see an older politician running for office, inevitably the opposition research will come out that he said something racist in 1977, or he did something sexist in 1980. Well, the world was racist and sexist a lot more than it is now back then. The whole point is, did this person evolve? Is this man or woman a better human being now? Because they changed as the world has gotten better. And I think the world has gotten better. Despite what's going on right now, I think the world has gotten a lot better than it was when I was a kid for all marginalized groups and for the world community as a whole. So the idea that Zach Nefane would come back and go, oh, you married a human? Cool, you're having a baby with a human? Wow, that's, that's going to be a gorgeous kid. It just didn't make sense to me. This is a guy who grew up in Menzo Berenstein, probably never even saw a human before, just other, or if he did, it was in passing and probably in a fight. I just tried to be real about it. If you see Zach Nefane, that in the Generations trilogy, the character that has, who has the most growth is Zach Nefane DeWard, mm. by far. And well, speak- I can't say by far, because I think Adam and Centuri had a little growth, too. But, but, but anyway. <laughs> so speaking of growth, um, Regis, um, yes. I, it's interesting how in, in the books, he's like everything seems in, in very serious in your books. But Regis is having the time of his life. Uh, what, what are your thoughts about his evolution from, from the crystal shard to well, I would say Wolfgar's, ha- I would say Wolfgar's having the time of his life, but Regis, when I did the companions, um, the companions was like the hardest, one of the hardest books I've ever written because here it was, the world had been advanced a hundred years because of that Regis, Wolfgar, Caddy, Bree, and Bruno were all gone. And I knew when they did fourth edition and they did that hundred year jump that they were going to be panicking in a few years because they gave so many people a reason to jump out of the realms more than a jumping on place. They made a jumping off place. And so Ed Greenwood and I were plotting for years on what we were going to do when they came back to us and said, we got to fix the realms, which they did. And we were ready with answers and we helped them fix the realms. And my suggestion was the first thing you got to do is you got to bring back characters people loved, but each God should bring them back in his or her own way or in its own way, I guess, with gods. I I don't think you can really apply gender there or of any type, but the, the gods should find their own way to bring back the people. We need to bring back some of the iconic characters. And so I did that through Arula Dune and Maliki and, and, but now that's a really risky thing because when you kill characters and you keep bringing them back, and I do that a lot in the realms. I don't do it in my Demon Wars books, but I do it a lot in the realms, especially here. That's really risky because you're taking all the tension out of it if you don't do it right. And so I was very nervous going into writing the companions. But instead of just bringing them back, I wanted to answer that question of what it would be to go back now, like go back to junior high school now, knowing what I know now. Everybody asked that, right? If only I knew then what I know now. It's a big cliche for a reason. And so with Bruner, he went back there and he was answering the question of, you can't do this. He was mad because it felt like bringing him back to life cheapened everything he had accomplished. He had accomplished all of this. He had died fighting for what he believed in, you know, and and now he's back to life again. He he felt angry. And so he was answering that question. Caddy Bree was just fulfilling a journey that got stopped when it shouldn't have. Her journey of of that whole clash between Maliki and Loaf. And, but Regis now went back beginning from when he was reborn knowing then what he knew when he passed. And that was that his entire life had been spent in his mind as a hanger on to the group. And he, he knew that his responsibility 
now that he understood the world that lay ahead of him, the adventures that lay ahead of him, was to be ready to contribute and not just kind of follow everybody else who was saving him in situation after situation. You saw that in a couple of the books before, before uh, The Last Threshold, too. You saw it, I mean, The Ghost King, too. You saw it in um, some of the books when he was trying to be a hero but couldn't quite get there. Um, so with Regis, he came back as someone who was determined from birth to make more of himself. And, but he still has that, oh, I don't, that's, he's big. I don't want to fight him attitude now and then. He's fun to write. <laughs> so he's you, fun to write. You, you've inspired tons of um, role-playing stories based because of your books. Um, what, if someone wants to, uh, how should I say, like the Salvatore experience, like as in like, you know, wanna <laughs> wanna play in 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 like like the in your world, like what what would you recommend them like to read outside maybe like the typical D D books? Is there especially when it comes to like uh describing fighting or or anything like that? Well I'd say for describing fighting, watch some movies like Crouching Tiger, right? Um that th those those movies, uh, the choreograph in some of those movies is just fantastic in a fantastical setting, if you will. It's beyond what humans can do. So if you want to choreograph battle scenes, you know, those are my go-to movies like that. Or watch, watch some boxing matches or MMA fights. Watch the, pay attention to the balance. Pay attention to the, the footwork. Watch sports. This is what I grew up doing, watching and playing sports. Um, then what was the other part? The, the, that's the fighting, and what was the other part? You were oh, well, like uh, I guess I would say, what what RPG or non RPG books would you use? Like if you were to game master, dungeon master a campaign, what would you bring to the table? When I game, when I do dungeon master, which is often, I usually bring to the table um, either folklore or theology or philosophy. And what I mean by that is I've run dungeons based on Dante's Inferno. Um, I try to find the mood that fits the setting. Um, James Joyce for me is like my favorite author. And, and if, I, if I read like the dead and the way the whole mood of Ireland and the dead, I can create a, I can create a, an entire city around it for a campaign, if you will, or entire countryside around it for a campaign. Um, so you know, to me, the, the whole trick of whether you're gaming or writing a book for that matter is that, particularly in fantasy, I'm talking strictly fantasy here, is that you're asking the reader to suspend disbelief on so many things already. You're asking them to believe in magic. You're asking them to believe there are dragons, to believe there are evil monsters lurking, to believe in, you know, magical healing you're asking them to believe all of these things already. What you have to get right beyond that is, is make everything else rhyme with reality. So if you have various cultures in your campaign or your books, they should work together or against each other in the same way that humans would expect. Even if it's elves and dwarves and orcs and halflings and humans, there should be a logic that a person who just understands our history can accept. Like there'd be a reason why somebody might be a trading partner with somebody. There'd be a reason why somebody else wants to conquer somebody. The idea that we're just gonna get up and do evil today, stop us, that, that it's boring. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a lot of people consider your work as the lore when it comes to all things Dark Elves and Drow. Um, is there, I mean, written so many books, uh, is there anything left in either draw religion, draw history, draw culture that you want to explore as a writer? Yep. That's almost done. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, that's good. That's, time, good. that's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> right, yes, uh, absolutely. There's, there's some, there's a couple of things left to do. Okay. And that's because I keep getting this question asked of me to ask you this, because there's just this weird rumor going around that this is, this is like it, like you're going to take a long break from, or maybe a permanent break from the all things drow. Um, 
Uh, any word about that or? Nothing I want to announce. <laughs> hmm. But no, I, I have been hearing this is the last book since I think Halfling's Gem. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. Hmm. I'm serious. The Halfling's Gem was supposed to be the last book. Sojourn was supposed to be the last book. Passage to Dawn was supposed to be the last book. Um, of course, uh, Hero was supposed to be the last book. The Last Threshold was supposed to be the last book. I'm old, but I'm not that old. I'm still writing. I'm still working. Uh, there's nothing to announce right now for me. But um, I haven't retired. I, consider, I actually did consider retiring because I have a lot of grandkids now, and I love spending time with them. Um, but not yet. Not quite yet. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs> All right. So I have one more question to ask you. But before I ask you this last question, I just want to say a thank you for myself and for my group from late 80s, early 90s. Uh, we were just a bunch of kids growing up in, oh gosh, the worst parts of the Bronx you can imagine. <laughs> you know, it was just... <laughs> Bronx, <yeah. laughs> but it, 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 for all of us, it was, it was difficult because, you know, we were just, um, uh, just trying to survive. We all come from really yeah. uh, negative... Uh, uh, very um, uh, pretty much abusive households uh, you know everything and it was and it, we could discover d d but it was really your books that of all the stuff coming out of time we really uh, really clutched on to because they 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 spoke to us they we understood what Teresa was going through when he was stuck in Baranza. we understood why he wanted to get out you know we we understood what it was like to be in a place where you're just a loner and no one understands you. And uh, there's just certain paths that you feel like you're being pushed towards, but you just want to get out of it. You want to strive out on your own. So sure. from all of us, we just we want to thank you. Um, so I my appreciate last that a lot. That means a lot to me. Yeah, you're, I could, I, I won't, I could go on forever <laughs> about how much, you're, how important. <laughs> Please do, I'm in, no, I'm only kidding. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> So, so my last question to you, um, when we are all dust and we are no more and our kids, kids, kids pick up your books, what is the one message you hope that they get from your books? Oh, that's a great question. First of all, to what you were saying, I think everybody feels alone and like a loner and misunderstood, especially kids in high school, young adults. I think that's that's such a common feeling. I think the I think the captain of the football team has pretended to the throne in his heart, deep in his heart, or her. You know, I I think that it's a universal feeling among people. But some people it's exacerbated because of the situation around them, whether in the family or in the neighborhood or whatever. But the one thing from my books that I hope people will always remember is that is the feeling that you're, you're part of something bigger than yourself. And that, you know, so many of the things, one of the things that bothers me the most and has since I was a little kid, and now, now I even understand it better because I've been able to gain some measure of, quote, success, the way we measure it here, um, is that so much of what we consider things you're supposed to have or do is bull. You know, I don't care if you've got a nickel in your pocket or a million dollars in the bank. A sunrise is a sunrise. And a sunset is a sunset. And that's more beautiful than any artwork you're going to hang on your wall so you can show it off to your friends. And that's how I try to live my life. That's how I raise my kids to live their lives. Um, and the most important thing around you are the people you put around you. I mean, he, you know, the friends, the family, whether it's family that's, that's of blood or a family that's of friends. I mean, look, in my books, you have a dark elf married to a human whose father is a dwarf, whose brother is another human, whose best friend is a halfling. But that's a family. And so for me, that's the way I think, I think more people should live their lives with goals toward finding that than in you know, buying a better car than their neighbor so they can kind of thumb their nose at their neighbor. In other words, find the things that really have meaning 
latch on to them, live your best life. And, you know, the fact that you even care about your kids and their kids and their kids should tell you that you're part of bigger, of something bigger than yourself. Yep, one day you're going to be dust. And what world did you leave for your kids? And what world for your grandkids? That's important. We're all part of something bigger. But you have, and then the second part of that would be, so many people focus, and I hear this mostly from writers, by the way. I want to be a writer. I got to get this book done, blah, 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 blah. And I keep telling people, quit worrying about the goal. Quit worrying about getting this book done and published and enjoy the journey. The journey is your life. Those six months you're writing the book are more important than whether or not the book gets published. Because that's six months of your life. That's one, one, what, 50th, if you're lucky, of your life. That there may be one-tenth of your life for all you know what's remaining. Enjoy the journey. Appreciate the little things along the way. When you're writing, when you find a solution to something in the middle of a book that still has months and months of work ahead of it. Appreciate that you're teaching yourself something every time you sit down to write a book or every time you walk out your front door. And, and that's, you know, it's the way I think more, if more of us lived our life worrying about being better people, taking care of each other, we'd all be happier. And that's what I hope everybody gets from my books. Well, a great way to end this. Um, everyone watching, thank you for doing so and um, um, have a great day. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.